Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Podcast, another Tim May Podcast. And uh, I hope I keep getting to say as usual, because uh, basically this will be just his second flight in the last three months. But uh, welcome aboard the Tim May Podcast again. Uh, awesome. You know him as Austin Ward. Glad to be back. Keep your hands off the throttles, would you? I'll handle that. But uh, uh, you just handled the uh, avionics. But uh, but I digress. Bottom line is uh, awesome. You know, as, as we record this, we're 10 days out from the season opener for Ohio State, the number number four team in the country, number three team in the country, depending on what poll, whatever you're looking at. Uh, bottom line, the uh, excitement is running really high at the moment. You agree with that? I mean, like, like you, I mean, you get tired of like the buildup right by about this point. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's can have it both ways. Like it was great to be back uh, in watching training camp, watching practices, obviously having in-person interviews. And then you're like, Oh wait, training camp is really long. Like, you know, we're just doing the media side of it. So that sounds kind of silly to complain about it, but I only say that because then you know how long that month must be, what it must feel like for the Buckeyes on the field, how much work goes into it, how tired they get of hitting the same people every single day and running, you know, the same plays and knowing what's coming on the other side of the ball and yeah, all that stuff that goes into it. But that's almost over. And you can tell that there's that light at the end of the tunnel that we're going to get some games to talk about soon. And those guys are going to get games to actually play so that we can talk about that and they can go compete. And uh, it's it's right here. It's you know, Ryan Day, I think, is the only one who's not ready for a game this week. He says that he was feeling a little nervous when, if you told him he had to go out and fill out a depth chart and send out a first unit this week. He still doesn't feel quite ready. All coaches always want more time, but I think everybody else, it's that point. It's it's time to get it rolling. Yeah, you know, we're going to get to that in a little bit, uh, you know, after, after my special guest. I mean, you know, right now they're trying to fit the pieces in the right places. And uh, it's funny because uh, this guy, I've got my special guest on this week, C. Grant. He was one of those fellas that came in in 1998 and uh, bided his time and moved from safety to corner to finally – uh, Mark D'Antonio found a place for him on the defensive edge, and uh, he ends up making. Well, let's let's face it. Maybe it wasn't the play of the game, but it was the final play of the game in the uh, in what turned out to be the national championship victory over Miami, and uh, etched his etched his little spot there in Ohio State history, definitely in folklore also. But uh, you know, uh, uh, always great to catch up with C. Grant. I mean, one of my favorite people, and you know. We're going to have, I'm going to play my conversation with him in just a moment, but uh, we're going to come back and you and I are going to talk about how, for example, uh, this week, uh, early this week, we kind of, I even did it at the end of last week, kind of put uh, Ryan Day in the dentist chair and tried to pull out, you know, pull out from him. Who are your starting linebackers? You know, who are going to be the starting linebackers? And you and I are going to discuss whether this late in the situation, whether that's a good thing or is that a bad thing? Or, you know, they're waiting on, obviously, word as we speak here on Pelier, Pelier uh, Neoteote, the uh, transfer from USC. They were just waiting on whether or not he's even going to be eligible. So I'll be up front with that. By Probably by the time most people tune into this, are going to know whether he's going to be eligible from a transfer situation to play immediately for Ohio State. But, yeah, I mean, we did put him in the bar in the uh, in the uh, old dentist chair, didn't we? Got to. Well, yeah, you know, it's time to put it in uh... – perspective so that people can update their programs and be ready for next Thursday night. Yeah, I was going to say, man, but right now, you know, I can tell you the starting defensive line is going to be, I do believe, but uh, until somebody steps up and says, you know, these are the starting linebackers and this is the starting defensive secondary, you know, I think we're all and we're going to get into that in a minute. But, uh, you know, first, I want to get into my conversation with C. Grant, uh, the, the man from New Philadelphia who showed up at Ohio State. And before he was done, became a star. Uh, and now I'm not talking about just playing on the field, but singing. And I got a little bonus for you, or he's got a little bonus for you during a, near the end of this uh, conversation. Stay tuned. No one sings Carmen, Ohio, better than C. Grant. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, without further ado, let's get to my special guest for the week. I mean, this is one of my favorite players. I say this all the time, C. Grant. This is one of my favorite players of all time about different guys, but you definitely are, man, because uh, – you not only walk the walk, you sang the talk. And uh, I think everybody remembers C. Grant from that 2002 National Championship game coming off the edge with the final play that 
that, uh, as I call it, the uppercut that knocked Miami out, knocked Ken Dorsey out, and gave Ohio State that 2002 national championship. But, uh, C. Grant, welcome to the Tim May podcast, finally. Hey, Mr. May. Hey, I'm so stoked to be on your show. I've been telling you that uh, throughout social media and whatnot. So I'm just glad to be here and, and, and to talk with you today, man. You're, you're, you're definitely a legend. Well, let me, let me say this before we move on. You can come on my podcast anytime you feel like making a comment about anything. So uh, keep that in I mind. Uh, I will. I that. Number, number two, before we get into, you know, your stardom, your stardom days, you know, reliving those days when uh, yards were a lot longer to get than, you know, they are now. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> when you yes, plowed sir. with a blind mule like my dad did, things like that. Um, uh, what does it take? I mean, you're looking at this. Ohio State uh, football team this year. A lot of people think it's, again, one of the top four teams in the country. But you're looking at a defense that took a lot of licks last year. You watch those games. And uh, they're looking for basically three new starting linebackers. And, you know, you're one of those guys and that paid his dues, waited his turn. And then finally, you know, when you got your shot, you more than took advantage of it. But uh, uh, just I, I guess but what's your take on – these you know, linebackers having to wait their shot, and yet with young guys coming up behind them, what do you think a lot of these guys like Taraja Mitchell, Kevon Pope, uh, even Dallas Gant, who've been waiting for a while, are thinking right about now? I mean, right, right now it's business. I mean, you've been there a while. Uh, you're kind of feeling that pressure of, you know what, you know, now or, not now or nothing. And, and uh, you know, it's all, it's all about your approach on this. Um, you know, I had a guy – you talked about young guys pushing you. There, there was no guy pushed like myself with A.J. Hawk behind me, you know, potential yeah. uh, later on top five picks. So, you know, uh, you can either use that pressure. You always tell the guys who I coach, pressure is either going to, uh, you know, bust or, or, or you're going to make a diamond out of it, man. And so uh, I think for these older guys for Ohio State, you know, we have great tradition there in that linebacker room. So, you know, they pay their dues, but at the end of the day, it's business. And the best guy is going to play. And you have to understand, even with my son, who's a sophomore in high school, these young guys are coming out of high school ready and more, and, you know, more, more ready to play right away. Yeah. So when when you're there already in that locker room, you need to have your own motivation, your own journey, and find a way to get out on the field. So I think if uh, if they embrace it the right way, it could be good energy and help the whole linebacker room. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, it's put up or shut up right now for a lot of the older guys. So See, uh, you know, yeah, but, I, you know, I don't know if frustrating is the right word, but for waiting, waiting those, you know, because you played, you played off and on all through, you know, your career, but – Waiting for that shot to be the guy, one of the guys, you know, uh, was it ever frustrating for you? Was it ever uh, – uh, how would you describe it? You know what I mean? Just sort of being in line. Uh, you know, very, very frustrating. You know, I look at it like this, man. I came in with a guy, Donnie Nicky. You know, uh, we were like bookends, you know, both small town guys uh, having an opportunity to play, you know, with the big boys there at the Ohio State. And so yeah. when you go into competition, you know, in that situation, Donnie and I are 1998 guys. We come in together and right there, you know, uh, competition is going to bring the best out of you. But you're also looking at it, too, like, hey, this guy and I are the same age and, you know, and, and, and there's only so many spots on the team. And so, you know, in 98. You know, uh, Coach Pug, Coach Coop, you know, Don, Donnie beat me out for the safety position. And then, you know, you're sitting there and, you you know, you have to gather yourself. Uh, you you got to stay uh, focused up here. And then the following year, they bring in, you know, a, a potential, you know, later on consensus All-American and Michael Dawes. And so and so now now the free safety and the strong safety positions are gone for a person like myself. And so you're, you're competing. You're trying to find a way. You have a new coaching staff coming in with Coach Trestle at the time. And I was just, you know, fortunate to be blessed enough to be an athlete to where, you know, th th there were a couple other options. And, and then in two, 2001, played corner. And so I think my journey, uh, there was a lot of pain. There was a lot of tears with it. But it actually, you know, Monday, M Monday quarterback looking at it, it actually had a uh, giving me an opportunity to showcase my talent, man. I had a chance, you know, there's not too many guys at the Ohio State, 
who can say, you know what, I know how it is to be out there on the island one on one with some of the best talent in the country. And then, you know, in the following year, go back in there and play in the, in the box and, and, and you know, and, and stop the run. So I think my journey, uh, I tell my kids and I tell who will listen, you know, you know, it's easy to get caught up in the 2002 and it's easy to get caught up into Carmen, Ohio. But when you look at my journey from 1998, red shirting and yeah. then, you know, all the competition battles, you know, that that can either make you a bitter ball player and you end up in that portal or you can become a brotherhood and friends for life. You know, when I think of two of my guys, it, it's Donnie, Nicky and Michael Doss till this day. Yeah. And so I allow that competition to get in the way. If anything, it, it, it fueled me. I thank those guys because I had an opportunity to showcase my talent. So for, for these older uh, gentlemen who are in that linebacker room, um, embrace this. You know, it's no different than out here in real life. You may not be where you want to be always, but keep to the grind. Keep professional. I see a lot of the guys are continuing to be professional and your day will come. Uh, one way or another, if you see your journey through it, the Ohio State is well worth uh, seeing it all the way through. Yeah. And ladies and gentlemen, this this young man was from New Philadelphia High School. New Philly, as you like to call it. What do they call it? Almost West Virginia? What do they call it over there, uh, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> we call it T.C. County now, man. You know what? I'm glad to be one of the guys uh, to be able to help put uh, Tuscarawas County on the map. But when I was coming out, um, you know, uh, you know, we're out there near Amish country, man. There's, uh, yeah. you know, I came from very humble beginnings, but I will tell you, there was a legend there at New Philadelphia before I ever walked those hallways. And, and the guy who I always heard was the great Woody Hayes. Yeah. And, you know, get coached at my high school there. So, so we have some uh, claim to fame. Um, and, and there was uh, plenty of motivation during my high school years to try to, you know, get to the big time at the Ohio state. So yes, yeah, it's, it's T County right now. Yeah. There you go, man. <laughs> call it whatever you want. Just don't call it late to the playoffs. That's the way I look at it. Hey, uh, who came up to you? Who, 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 I mean, I remember all of what you just talked about, but the enlightened people who, approached you about moving back into the box? Was it Mark D'Antonio, uh, defensive coordinator then? Who, who who thought you could be an edge a factor coming off the edge and, and basically also cover, you know, tight end? You know what I mean? Just all kinds right. of ways they could use you there, give them a few options there. Because it's funny how a championship team is built sometimes, isn't it? People see parts that fit exactly what they what they have envisioned. But who approached you about that? Man, uh, Coach Mark D'Antonio, uh, I, I was a guy who, uh, you know, I understand that, you know, there's politics. I understand it's business. I always just ask them, my coaches to be transparent with me, you yeah. know, so, so that I could be, uh, you know, mentally where I needed to be. But uh, to answer your question, it was Coach Mark D'Antonio. He said, you know what, see, um, you know, a lot of respect to you, you know, to be 230 pounds playing corner <laughs> at the Ohio 2001, what a lot of people don't know, uh, Mr. May, is I was at the Batman's table. You know, I was on the diet table, probably one of the only defensive back guys at 230 on the Batman's table in 2001 trying to lose weight. But uh, I think after that season, uh, after the loss uh, to the Gamecocks and the Outback Bowl, um, you know, we jumped on it right away, starting with, the, you know, that team up North film. And Coach Antonio came to me. He said, listen, see, he says, I, I want to play the best 11 guys. He says, uh, what, what's your thought about moving into the box? And, I, and so me being who I am, I'm like, where, where are you coming from with this? You know, let's talk about it. He goes, well, personnel packages. You've already had, you know, your, your feet wet out there on the corner playing corner. He goes, when you're up here as a coordinator, you're looking down at personnel, uh, you know, formations that are coming in. We could actually play nickel a little bit with our base personnel. So we don't have to run a linebacker out and bring a defensive back in. You just take the third guy. And then that way we can do, you know, kind of do some funky stuff off of that. You know, that, you know, it didn't take a rocket science that made sense. And, and, and for that year of 2002, it just so happened to work for us uh, the, uh, the right way. But if 2001 wouldn't have happened to see that, okay, he's covering the number two wide outs, the number three, you know, uh, I, I don't think we would have gotten to that point. And then there's a quick backstory off of that real quick. I know I'm long-winded. No, Coach fine. Mark Dan uh, recruited me, him and Mel Tucker, um, with Nick Saban's staff at Michigan State at that time. And so when they were recruiting me, it was as a defensive back. So, you know, you know, those coaches are smart, man. They remember no, no matter where they're at, 
uh, what type of players you are. And it just so happened with Coach Bowman and Trestle and all those guys coming together. A lot of those guys were from that staff and kind of knew how I was coming out of high school, man. So it was just uh, the glory of God that it all came together the way it did. Yeah, I was going to say, man, I mean, it, you know, I picked Ohio State to win the national championship to beat Miami in that game. And, you know, the reason I picked them, and I even said it on television then, was, you know, yeah, I thought Craig Krenzel and Michael Jenkins and uh, Maurice Claret and the offense was doing a pretty good job, pretty good job of being dramatic, you know, overly dramatic, right? <laughs> but uh, but I thought that without a doubt, I still think the difference in that team and that, that what made it a champion was – the way you guys played defense and the way you were able to make plays at the right times, et cetera. And it really, you know, it came, everybody was talking about Miami's defense going into that game. I thought y'all were, were equal to, if not better than them. You know, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, just the yeah. way that, and then you look at the players on that, on that defense. I mean, you know, yourself, I mean, Matt Wilhelm, uh, right. you know, right on down the line, Will Smith, you know, Darian Scott, uh, uh, Kenny Peterson. I mean, in the, you know, Dustin Fox, all these guys, you know, in the back, Chris Gamble and, you know, Mike Doss and uh, Donnie Nick. I mean, it was it was a great defense, wasn't it, when you look back on it. It's one of the great defenses in school history. I think it was uh, – uh, I, I do think we were a great defense, uh, you know, and uh, I, I think everybody had a story there. You know, if you look at that 2002 year, um, it wasn't smooth sailing, you know. <laughs> I think we, we were dubbed the name the Cardiac Kids, but if you look at the coaching – um, that was on that staff and, and how they, uh, uh, you know, metamorphed into who they are now. You look at the Luke Fickles on that team. You look at the Mel Tuckers. You look at, you know, of course, Dan Antonio Trussell and, uh, and guys like that, Tim Spencer. But I, I think we grew a lot within that season. You know, um, uh, you know, whenever we moved Chris Gamble over the defense, I thought that was huge. Yeah. Um, it, it was it was something that we didn't prepare for in the spring or throughout that camp, but it was a need. And I think that Cincinnati game when we were looking around and and, and literally for, for you know throughout the season, uh, Chris wasn't practicing defense. That you know, uh, it was just on the fly, telling him what cover three was, get back in the deep third. You know, and, but yeah. he was just a great athlete. So you had that dynamic. I think um, when you look at the duo at safety, I thought we had leadership in the right positions. When you look at uh, I don't think there's a tandem like Michael Dawson, Donnie Nicky, who have the, the number of starts together. So that was good to have that leadership on the back end, along with young guys like Chris Gamble and Dustin Fox. Yeah, and way. And, well, and Will Allen jumping in there every now and then. Are you kidding? Will Allen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, and Mike Mike was the guy who took, you know, Will Allen underneath his uh, wing. Yeah. I can remember Will's uh, journey from day one up until, you know, becoming an All-American there uh, in his last year. Uh, so, so that back end had great leadership and great talent. When you look at our linebacker room, you know, um, I think I was kind of like an ex guy to, to, to where I could, you know, do some coverage play in the box. But when you look at guys like Matt Wilhelm, who's an all American, you look at a guy who, um, like, like Robert Reynolds, you know yeah. I mean? Just left him out a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. You know I, mean? I, I thought we had that type of leadership in the room. And then you look at Bobby Carpenter, AJ Hawk, you know, uh, the slew of young guys that we had in that room who were selfless. And then you look at our front line, man, you get Will Smith, from day one when he came on campus, we knew he was going to be special. But you get him as a junior. You get Darian Scott. You get a tough guy like Tim Anderson yeah. down there. Uh, then Kenny. And then you get, the, again, the younger guys like Simon Frazier and everybody. As we stuck together, and, and it wasn't about um, individuals, it was about team, I just think that we grew. And like you said, we got, got better and better. So we have been battle-tested. We have been in overtime games. We have been in close games. So um, I don't think we got up tight in that game. And, and we knew what type of team Miami was. I mean, everybody saw how they played against Nebraska in that scene the year before. But, you know, we had a chip on our shoulder, too. You know, the guys in the Big Ten weren't that slow. We weren't slow that night. So it was just a great time. And, um, and the stars aligned right, man. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, anybody called y'all, I mean, people weren't paying attention. That's the main thing. And then you get, you know, people get these – images in their minds of Big Ten football, et cetera, and just instead of looking at what's happening right in front of them, you know, which drives me crazy sometimes. Hey, real quick, let's move on here real quickly, but I, want, I do want to ask you this. 
what was the defense? And I, I did this on a 10 or 15 year anniversary. I talked to you about this, but what was the defense you guys called on that fourth down when you came off the edge there in overtime, the, the play that cemented it? Uh, do you remember? Tight, Will, Tulsa. Wait, wait, say it again. Tight Will Tulsa. And I, I know, I know what you're talking about. A couple of guys have said it was something else like nickel maca and whatnot, but it was tight. Will Tulsa uh, talked to Mark D'Antonio about coach Mark D'Antonio about that about a year or so ago. It's tight, Will Tulsa. And your your job on that play was it to delay and then come, or was it just to come from the snap? No, it wasn't to come uh, from from the uh, snap. Uh, we always want to uh, disguise our uh, our blitzes, disguise our coverage. If anything, I, I kind of jumped the gun. Uh, whenever uh, that play was called, I can remember Matt Wilhelm, you know, and Will Smith. Those are the last two guys I locked eyes with. But my job was to stay in the box and then, you know, slowly creep outside and catch them in the cadence and then come off the edge. But if you remember that play, I got excited because there was only a tackle there. And yes. I don't believe the back offset correctly. So what I didn't want to do was be delayed on the blitz. I'm like, that tackle – is not going to get his hand off the ground and block me in enough time. So it was one of those things where, you know, show the skies, come out, come outside and, and, and come to the up shoulder and, and, and get the person on the ground. That's state law. So, uh, yeah, it, that it, is it, state you know. law. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, though, I've, I've, I don't think I've ever asked you this, though. That was probably the biggest play of your football career when you really think about it. I mean, definitely the most memorable, but like, you know, you work, you bust your butt, you know, you you go from safety to whatever, to corner, and you move inside, I mean, through your career. And then on the right. biggest, what turns out to be greatest, biggest play of your football career, it's like everything just opened up and it was, it was, it was almost too easy, wasn't it? I mean, as you came off the edge, I mean, it's just, is that still mind boggling to you that in the most critical moment of that game, everything just laid out in front of you just like that? Man, um, it's one of those things where, you know, I thought about my mother and my mom always said, you know, to all of her kids, but I can remember her saying to me, see, whatever it is that you do in life, make an impact, make an impact. You know what I mean? Just don't be a floating soul through through life. So throughout that game, I was on Coach Snyder and Coach D'Antonio, like, man, call my number, call my number, call my number. But uh, I can remember when Matt called that play, everything kind of slowed down like the movie. You know, and I was just like, wow, you know, here's my three, two, one last buzzer beater shot, you know, and, and literally, uh, you know, kid you not, I, I went to thinking about being a small town guy from Tuscarawas County, New Philadelphia, Ohio, you know what I mean? Up there near Amish country, man. And just thinking about my journey through there and my journey through Ohio State, this all happened pre-snap and while things were going. And I thought about my brothers. I thought about the guys out there on the field. I thought about each and every one of their journeys, because if, if you stick it out four or five years, it's going to come with blood, sweat and tears. It, it's just you got to accept it, you know, throughout that uh, part of life. So when I thought about that, I thought of the great Woody Hayes, man. I, I think about, you know, those pictures that I saw him out there on those cold days in those short sleeve collared shirts and just that fire that he had. And I said, you know what? Here's an opportunity of a lifetime. And you know what? Uh, the, the Lord works in mysterious ways. And I'm a guy who lives in the moment. You yeah. know, I know you can't change yesterday. All you can do is learn from yesterday and add it to your repertoire for today. And there's a lot of people, Tim, who go to sleep at night thinking they have an agenda for the next day and it doesn't happen. So I realized that this was a moment and this was a great moment. And it was always going to be remembered one way or another. Um, in the great state of Ohio. And then you go think about your parents. You think about the sacrifices. You know, I had both my parents, but I think about the sacrifices that they made to give me that opportunity. And I knew they were somewhere there in the desert with me that day. And they had been for football games where I hadn't played, but they were Buckeye fans. They had been at games where I played terrible, but I knew that at the end of the day, they were there to support me. And this was a big moment. And, and it was just, it was just, it all came together and, and when and when Ken Dorsey said, Hut, man, I got one of the best jumps uh, of a blitz in my lifetime off and, uh, and grabbed him, believe it or not, uh, had cracked right ribs and a broken right pinky. But, man, it was just for your brotherhood. It was for the great state. And when 
he hit the ground. I, I literally couldn't hear anything. I was just like, and then it was when Mark Snyder grabbed me. He's like, we're the champs. I kind of get jolted back. And you talk about a frenzy. You talk about a natural high. You talk about, uh, you know, being early 20s and running around like a kid on Christmas morning. You know what I mean? You're just yeah. out of outer body experience. And you realize that all those uh, block of life with Coach Jim Trussell, you talk about, um, you know, those moments. You talk about uh, the brotherhood. You talk about... Um, you know, those Thanksgivings down the road, you know, talking to your kids, it all came true. It was worth staying for me. It was worth it because I had days where if there was a portal, Tim, I probably would have left at times. I, 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 it, it, it was rough, but it all came together. And it shows you just in life too, you know, see things through, you know, grass is not always greener on the other side. And if you'll see it through, the good Lord has something for you. And I just so happen to be uh, you know, one of the few who will actually see it through and, and get through that adversity because it's made me better. Uh, not, you know, just like you say, my NFL career was short lived, but it that experience coming through the Ohio State that has helped me so much just in my professional life. And I still am doing the things that I want to do. I have a beautiful family, five kids, um, a beautiful wife of 17 years. And a lot of the things that I put in my sons and daughters are right there where I learned there at the Ohio State. I had great parents, but I learned about life. You know, when you're 18 to 22 years old, uh, you have a lot that comes your way. You know, I can remember feeling immortal. I can do anything. I can remember feeling down and out, but you go through changes. And it's important that you have some of the masterminds like a John Cooper, a Jim Trussell, a Mark D'Antonio, Fred Puggage, and then teammates, you know, who will go on and be coaches. I have that going on too, and great teachers and leaders of men and women. And I just want to make sure that I withhold my my part of the deal to where, you know, I'm an offspring from the Ohio State, no matter where I go. I've been all over this country. And I want to make sure that when you interact with C. Grant, you understand that, man, he's been around something special. And uh, the Ohio State plays a great big part in that. And um, I appreciate you giving me, you know, this time to even, you know, share some of that with you. Oh, yeah. Oh, I was getting goosebumps. Some of that stuff, man, it was crazy. Uh, you know, see, I had Craig Krenzel on last week. It's not like it's old home week for 2002. He's a guy who fought for a starting job, you know, like C.J. Stroud, as we speak. C.J. Stroud has been named the starter for Ohio State, yeah. you know, after a three-man battle. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so we'll see where that goes. But what I was going to get to you uh, is, do you feel like you guys, the 2001, 2002 teams, you, you beat Michigan, 2001, 2002, y'all win the national championship. But that was, as you look back now, that was the start of the snowball, right? I mean, this has just been watching a snowball run downhill, and it keeps seems to be getting bigger and badder and better <laughs> every year, but that's where it started. Don't you agree? I mean, with, with oh, you guys in that turn of the century. I, I definitely agree. You know, when I came in in 98, we were at a pretty high, you know, a pretty big high. We were preseason yeah. number one. And, you know, and it was, you know, you go think about Sparty, but no, we, we had suffered a six and six season too. And it was that kind of uncertainty, like which direction is this program going in? And, you know, um, I, I can remember with Coach Cooper, you know, uh, we were getting the wins, but were we getting the right wins? And, and at that, you know, um, that team up north had gotten in the way of so much success throughout the 90s. It was literally a gorilla on our back, you know, as a program. And I think, uh, you know, and whenever we made that change to Coach Jim Trussell, um, it was new blood. He, he came in to that basketball arena and he said what he said. You know, he basically had drew a line in the sand and said, enough's enough. And uh, I can remember talking to the guys and saying, you know, this guy is from the great state of Ohio. And, and anybody, no matter where you go to in the great state of Ohio, you know about the Ohio State. And, uh, and, and it was about, you know, Coach Trussell was able – uh, he was brilliant. He was able to get us to buy in very, very quickly. We, we went through a lot of our uh, uh, adverse situations in 01, but we were prepping for greatness. And um, yeah. so, you know, at the turn of century, I think in 01, when, whenever we went up there and did exactly what he said that we were going to do before he had met any of us, um, that, that kept the ball going. And I believe there's only been one or maybe two times since that 0-1 win to where that team has even been uh, 
close to us. And then you think of the different changes. OK, Coach Trestle's gone. Um, they bring in Urban Meyer and now and now the recruiting um, takes uh, and goes to the next level. And now, now Ryan Day, he's even more of a next level guy. So <laughs> it's going to be keep up with the Ohio State. Uh, I'm looking at some of these other teams in the Big Ten, you know, especially these secondary coaches. And you got Garrett Wilson. You got Chris Olave. Uh, now you got C.J. Stroud. We have a great tight end and, uh, and, and a great up front. Uh, and the young guy at uh, Henderson at running back with, with uh, Master Teague. Yeah. Um, you know, we're going to give some teams some fits this year. And I'm excited. Uh, I told my son, I said, I would love to see that scoreboard hit 100. And um, uh, I, I feel like uh, we, we have a very good team. And I feel like defensively, uh, I've had a lot of people say, so what about the linebackers? See, what's going to happen defensively? I feel like they're going to grow. Each and every day, uh, there's a standard at The Ohio State. You're going to get better uh, as, as a core unit. And I think, um, I think that they have to come into themselves and they have to understand that, you know, you come from greatness. You know, there was a time when we're called silver bullets, you know what I mean? And we need to get back to that. I understand the hitting and stuff and the rules have changed, but there is a sense of pride, a gut check, you know, and guys will, guys will grow and guys will uh, step up. And I think when you see the offense hitting on all cylinders, that, that gives us a little bit more room, maybe defensively to, uh, you know, work through our, um, you know, our, our, our little growing and bruises. Yeah. Yeah. Growing but I think we're going to be fine. I think it's going to come together very beautiful for us this year. Yeah, you think about football like I do, man. I always believe uh, any touchdown you score offensively eases eases things up from a predictability standpoint for your defense, you know, right on down the road. And I've discussed that on this podcast many times in different ways. But uh, you're right. I think this – if you can turn the other team in a little bit more one-dimensional, it makes a youngish defense with some really talented defensive ends, especially young right. guys – kind of sets them up, you know, <laughs> for, you know, yeah. get it done, you know. You, if you look at some of the guys who we've even brought in, you look at those bookends uh, like JT and, and you look at, oh, I cannot think yeah. of the guys. Uh, J- uh, Jack Sawyer. Jack yeah. Sawyer. I mean, the, these are guys who at any other school, they're plugging them in right now. You're yeah. going you're, you're, you're to be program changers. And, uh, and the thing that I love about the Ohio State is the young men look like they're happy to be there. You know, they're going to go through some changes uh, with all the rule changes as far as uh, the money and everything that's going into effect. But it's going to it's going to be a point to where they're going to be educated. Uh, our school officials are going to be educated. But one thing I like, it just looks like they're glad to be a Buckeye and they're glad to be there and they really want to represent. I really like the culture that we have right now of the inclusion, you know, on Monday, there'll be a bunch of former, uh, you know, Buckeyes who will go and take part in practice. And, uh, and and I love the inclusion because you can't get to where you're at today without your past and, and, and you need who you are right now to get your future. And I think that we can all work together because we're all going to fill these slots at some point. I can remember being a future Buckeye and how that felt. Yeah. Uh, I can remember being, current Buckeye and I and I was a former Buckeye the most important is the current the current there's nothing like being a current Buckeye because you control the state of Ohio the emotions through Saturday Sunday at the beginning of the work week you actually get to control people's feelings who really love and care about you that's Um, crazy isn't it that's crazy it 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 really is so I'm rooting for these young men to uh, go after a national title I mean that's that's why you signed that letter of intent I tell guys all the time, yeah, it's, it's nice to throw Ohio State's hat in there and say, yeah, they're one of the top three. But it's a whole nother ball game, even when you sign that letter of intent. These guys who have jobs there, they're not trying to uh, get come off of their jobs to even these talented uh, young guys. I know that from from a fact with A.J. Hawk, and I love that guy to death. But it's all about great competition. And I'll, I'll end it like this. With the level of talent that we have at The Ohio State, and with the standard of getting better each and every day, we're going to get better. Those guys who are true freshmen this year, the running backs, and those guys who are going to get those reps, by the end of the year, they're, they're already going to be, you know, darn near sophomores as far as their maturity and knowing the game and their body and understanding what we're all about. So this is a heck of a season to look forward to. We're going to have fans in the shoe versus last year where it wasn't. I mean, we're, we're all going to be thankful and grateful 
uh, when Saturday comes at the first game to be like, man, we almost lost on this. You know, let's be blessed. The incomparable C. Grant. Middle C Grant, you know, middle C is on the piano there. It's the middle C, you know, and then there's the next C and then there's the next C. And uh, what I'm leading up to here is, see, one of the great traditions in Ohio, in Ohio State football now was started by Jim Trussell in 2001. You guys went down in front of the band or down in, and sang Carmen, Ohio, pretty much win or lose, right? Uh, Y'all sang yeah. Car yeah, Carmen, Ohio, and there's nobody – who was better at singing Carmen Ohio than, than you see Grant. And uh, can I twist your arm, man? I, I know Ohio state fans listen to this. Uh, this is still one of the greatest hits out there. This might as well be, you know, uh, right up there with anything the Beatles did, the Bee Gees, whomever, you know, was the great selling records of all times. Give me a rendition of, of Carmen Ohio, if you don't mind. I got you, man. Let's 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 see what I'm working with. I'm 41. Let's see if we can still do this. <clears throat> oh, come, let's sing on highest praise and song through all my martyrs. While our hearts rebounding thrill and joy which death alone can still, summer's heat or oh, winter's cold. The seasons pass, the years will roll. Time and change will surely show how firm thy friendship, oh, how Go Bucks! 2021 belongs to us in Jesus' name. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the incomparable C. Grant. C. Grant, you're going to be on my podcast every now and then from now on, man. Uh, I don't Me. know. I, I, I can't throw money at the stage right now. If I could, I would. But uh, anything I can do to rekindle that singing career, man, just let me know. Hey, man, I appreciate it. Hey, I'll tell you what, man. When I met you uh, early in 1998, and uh, I said, man, one, one of these days before it's all said and done, man, I'm going to have an opportunity to have a sit down with you. Man. Yeah. So this was one of my bucket lists, and I appreciate you making it happen for me today. Ladies and gentlemen, C. Grant, thanks for joining the Tim May Podcast. Go Bucks. Thank you so much, sir. You know, I've covered a lot of guys. Awesome Ward at Ohio State. You know, you have too at this point. But, uh, <laughs> man, C. Grant is as great a personality as I've ever run into on that team, and there have been a lot of them. But uh, that rendition of, of Carmen, Ohio, man, that, that I'm sure for a lot of Ohio State fans, that touched some heartstrings. Well, I, you know, I've had a couple, you know, exchanges with him over the years, uh, just being around and yeah. that big personality. You're right. Even though I didn't cover him when he was uh, in college and making big plays in national championship games, uh, you can tell that uh, he's got a special place for – Ohio State fans, they love how much he's engaging, whether that's social media or popping up at events or wh wherever. I mean, he's a, he remains a pretty popular character. You make big play, uh, big plays like that, and, and win a title at Ohio State, uh, you've always got a, a special place in all their hearts. I was going to say, the play that ended it all, the walk-off uh, near sack twist of uh, Ken Dorsey, who's ever going to forget that? Well, I don't know. That was 19 years ago. Maybe a lot of people haven't even seen it. <laughs> But I digress. Bottom line, appreciate C. Grant. I told him I'm going to have him on every now and then because he has some great observations about a lot of things. And one of which was, you know, he was fighting to, to get a role in that defense in 2002. As I, as I prefaced, uh, you know, Mark D'Antonio moved him over there uh, almost out of the clear blue sky. And the next thing you know, he was a vital cog in that defense. And, you know, as we sit here, uh, like, like I prefaced earlier, 10 days before Ohio State's opener, uh, as we record this, we don't know what the starting lineup's going to be uh, in the in the linebacker situation. 
We think we know what the starting lineup's going to be in the secondary, but that depends on who they put on the field. Are they going to put two linebackers and five DBs on the field? Is Craig Young going to be a, the bullet that's in there early? That's going to, you know, um, mess with things. I mean, uh, I don't know. Is that troubling to you? I mean, obviously we knew who the linebackers were for the last couple of years <laughs> going into the year, but uh, I mean, by troubling, I mean, uh, and I don't even use the word concern because you and I are sports writers, you know, we're not really concerned, but uh, should it be troubling for Ohio State fans that we can't get a clear answer on who their starting linebackers are, uh, who they're starting, what their starting secondary is going to look like at this moment? Uh, probably, I mean, the uncertainty at linebacker, I would say, would be more of an issue for Ohio State than the secondary because I think they, they're they overflowing with talent um, in the true at, at safety and corner and the bullet position with guys who play with a defensive back mentality. They will put the, together the pieces. I, I feel pretty strongly that they will reclaim that BIA moniker and be one of the best pass defenses in the country. A part of that is going to rely – on the linebackers also taking a step forward. They can't do it all by themselves in the secondary. I mean, looking at that back seven the collaboration, and I don't know, you know, who exactly it's going to be. Taraja Mitchell was elected a captain. He's been healthy throughout this camp. So you have to assume that he's going to take one of those spots. I think that Cody Simon would be in line for the other, but as we've seen throughout camp, he, Dallas Gant, Tommy Eichenberg, an open practice last Wednesday that we were at, all three of those guys were in the pit. Yeah, uh, they're not expected to have any long-term uh, unavailability. They, you know, long-term injuries, uh, and they may all well be ready to go next Thursday night. Probably will be, um, but I still don't know exactly what that means. Dallas Gantz waited a long time. He's got the most experience out of anybody actually in that group. Um, can he be counted out as a starter? Probably not. Especially if you want uh, a veteran presence out there against a Minnesota team that has a ton of that uh, on their offense with a, a great one-two punch there in their backfield, quarterback and running back. Yep. So, you know, it's – I don't know what the right word is for it. It's the most uncertain unit, and I think that the the play together between the secondary and linebackers, like, I think that's why you're probably going to see more nickel looks, um, you know, bullet, bullet looks, however you want to phrase it, however that works out with the matchups because they have more to borrow from the secondary than they would to give from linebacker. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting is, uh, you know, we're talking to talk to Craig young early this week and uh, man, he reminds me, I mean, people think, you know, they, this just got invented this kind of look. I mean, Roger Harper was actually at practice a bunch of uh, uh, quite a few of the ex players were invited to practice uh, this early, this, this past Monday and, uh, boy, it's amazing how many showed up. But uh, one of them was Roger Harper, who I haven't seen in a while. And he played safety at Ohio State long ago. He was a big guy. Uh, but I don't remember anybody being in a bullet safety kind of position that reminds me of Craig Young. Uh, I, I, I'm just I'm, – I'm really curious and – in the sense of how he is going to fit, whether he's going to be able to be that jack of all trades they want from him, but where he's going to be the better fit against a team that's more prone to run the ball and occasionally throw it to somebody. If you follow my drift from a, from a coverage standpoint, uh, I, I just think he's, he may be as intriguing a player as there is on this team in the sense of, I don't know how he's going to play. You know, I, I you have a, you have a, you have an idea of it, but you don't have a real, I don't have a real sense of it because I thought in the spring a few times we got to watch him play. I thought he got lost a, a few times. And by that uh, just maybe a little bit uh, indecisive of where he wanted to go. You know, he claims claims. I mean, he has worked on that. Clearly we've watched a little bit of practices and stuff and he's gotten a lot better in that regard, but my goodness, from a physical sense, that is a big guy playing a bullet or a quasi safety position. Agreed. Yeah. Without a doubt. And he seems to only be getting bigger. Yeah, uh, stronger, I should say, you know, he's he's one of the most impressive physical specimens that you're going to find anywhere. And I think that's what's tantalizing to the coaching staff about trying to find a role for him. And that's there's a little bit of give and take where early in the year there may be experimentation and debate and, you know, trying to figure out it's it's not a it's not a great situation, 
for Ohio State in terms of Minnesota and Oregon right off the bat, that there's no warm up to figure out, okay, well, is Court Williams going to be more reliable in here? Can you trade off what he may not have physically compared to Craig Young, just so that you know that schematically he's going to be as sound as anyone you've ever seen in terms of, you know, film study, knowledge of the defense and all that stuff. Like those two guys I expect would be the ones that you'd really see playing the bullet. And that's the coin flip that you're trying to go through. Like Craig Young, um, you know, a lot of, it reminds me as you're talking about guys that you've covered, Tim, there's a lot of Darren Lee and Ryan Shazier to Craig Young. Now those guys weren't asked to do a lot of the stuff in coverage that bullet will, and yeah. they probably could have if they needed to, that was a different, even 10 years ago, that's a different era of football um, and different responsibilities for that position. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm like you, I, I don't know how exactly that's going to work. I think that between those two and Ronnie Hickman, they're probably going to be on the field a lot more because they have to help pick up maybe some of the slack at linebacker. Um, and, you know, none of them have really played a whole lot. And Court Williams missed all of last year with that ACL injury. So you know, Ronnie Hickman was in and out of the lineup, and he was also dealing with injuries last year early in his career. So, you know, that's the part where you and I have said this for the last several weeks, and especially yeah. when we talk, after we talked to Al Washington and, and talked about the linebackers. Like, the potential is off the charts for these guys. Yeah, the, Ohio State's not taking – developmental projects here and trying to fit them into the lineup these are three really freakishly gifted players in a system that could feature that that talent very well but they still have to go out and do it for the first time yeah i was gonna say uh i'm i'm i just want to see them play because i want to be able to recognize what they look like playing i mean i, I called cody i called cody simon cody melton on the uh, radio the other day you know and it kind of, <laughs> i didn't even you know, it's kind of like how you call your different your well, you don't have a bunch of kids, but I, I'd call my daughter my son's name, son, my other son, you know what I mean, blah, blah, blah. But uh that's to be expected from a guy who's 67. But you know, they're not really etched into my brain yet. You know, if you follow what I'm talking about, right. you know, but I'm just you know, let's just ballpark it here. If you if you started a secondary uh that was a classic secondary, um, uh, you'd have seven banks, probably Cam Brown at the corners, right? I mean, based on what we're seeing, uh, yep. we've seen. You'd have Josh Proctor, even though Matt Barnes wouldn't even really commit to that, uh, as we talked to him earlier this week. I'm just going. Pretty weird. That was pretty weird. That was very strange. Uh, I don't even get it at this point, unless they're going to throw something totally ridiculous at us. I think Josh Proctor thinks he's starting. (laughs) But uh, so that's good for you. But who would be that other safety? Would it be uh, Lathan Ransom? I mean, who would you who would you have in there? You know, uh, Josh Proctor, you know, we get the idea is going to play a more of a classic free safety, a little bit more like what Jordan Fuller did, uh, you know, in that kind of role uh, when he was here, which, you know, they, boy, that was a loss, you know, when they lose that guy uh, a couple of years ago. But, but uh, what, 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 what's just your take on that? If it's classic. Yeah. If they were, well, if they're playing, you know, today, I think you'd see Josh Proctor as the single high safety. You'd have Lathan Ransom at that cover safety you know, playing down closer to the line of scrimmage and doing more uh, work perhaps against the slot receiver. Yeah. Uh, you're going to have, as you said, Cameron Brown and Seven Banks there as the starting cornerbacks. And that's that's where that intrigue then comes in. I, I've i seen throughout the open periods of practice, as have you, a lot of looks with that first unit where Court Williams is the third. Yes. Uh, what bullet, third, I don't know. Yeah. Back, whatever you want to call it. Nickel, Pardon. Buffalo, nickel, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, however you want to put that moniker on that, I've seen Court Williams out there a number of times uh, when they've gone to team periods. Um, often the first person out there has been Craig Young. Uh, then with the other four guys that we mentioned uh, from the traditional look. So, you know, I, I think that that will be, you know, the given, give and take the mix and match. Craig Young's probably more equipped at this point to help against the run rather than against the pass. And Court Williams has, you know, true kind of safety experience. But, you know, I remember watching him at, at St. John Bosco when Berman and I went out to California a couple of years ago, yeah. and they were unleashing him in a role that was identical to the bullet. And on the second play of the game, he blitzes around the corner and gets a sack in the backfield. And talk about all-time small sample sizes. I saw him play one game in high school, and he only needed to play about a quarter before they had blown out the opponent that night. But, 
you know, I've, I've always had that logic in my brain, just standing there on the sideline and watching what he can do, because I think that Court Williams, that injury, he was having a very strong training camp. He was going to be in that rotation last year uh, as a true freshman. I uh, think there's really no uncertainty about that, uh, especially if, if you gave some of that truth serum to Kerry Combs and Matt Barnes and Ryan Day. They loved what was happening for that guy. They talk about him being a president down the road and all kinds of high praise. Uh, That's right. I think, I think they know that he's got to be part of this plan and that uh, if there's maybe like anything holding them back in their mind, it's like make sure that the knee is okay. You know, he still hasn't been in a, any game ever for Ohio State. That'd be a lot to just say you're definitely going in from day one. Craig Young has at least been through some of this, been in the program for a couple of years, you know, proved himself on special teams. So, you know, I don't know exactly how that will play itself out, but that's you're, – you're building around, I'd say, those six people, and then there's a lot more talent that's pushing from behind there. Yeah, and I was going to say, you know, depending, you know, they're, they're, you know Kerry Combs and this group, they're really going to be big on matchups, situational and situational situation, situational situations. That, that really just came out of my mouth. And <laughs> matchups, uh, which can skew any kind of, like, pre-thinking on this because – Maybe they don't need, you know, the fellow in the slot that we think they need against Minnesota that they might need against Oregon, et cetera. It's all going to be based on who they're playing, et cetera. But, uh, God, if I say et cetera one more time too, man, I'm just going to go nuts. But uh, bottom line, <laughs> bottom line, I, I, you know, if I'm looking at the linebacker situation, I got to figure Taraja Mitchell is going to start. I mean, I don't know, because, you know, even when Ryan Day, when I brought up to Ryan Day, he says he's going to be on the field in some capacity, you know, <laughs> What does that mean? Special T, you know, he is a captain, you know, after yeah. all. Uh, but I'm looking at Taraja Mitchell. I'm looking at C Cody Simon. And, uh, you know, is Dallas Gant the next guy? Is if Nao Teote gets cleared, is he the next? Is he the, is he the other linebacker? If they put three linebackers, classic linebackers on the field, is Tommy Eichenberg? I like Tommy Eichenberg a lot. I know you do too. But it looked like he got banged up last week. Uh, Maybe even a look like an ankle kind of situation, maybe a high ankle deal. We'll guess we'll one of these days we'll find out. But uh, you know, I think they've got, like you said, I think they got some guys to choose from there, especially if Mayo Teote gets uh gets uh, gets deemed eligible. But uh, what's what would be your three? I think let me check. Give me two seconds to refer to this again. I want to make sure that I got this right. Um, yeah, Tommy Eichenberg. So in the previous scrimmage, was a champion, and not yeah. on that when we left the facility on Saturday and we were jotting down the <laughs> names. Yeah. yeah. Again, not supposed, not thinking that any of these were long term. That's what Ryan Day said after that. Right. Um, but it's a couple days situation, as you said. Maybe an ankle. We don't. We don't know. Hundred percent. Oh yeah, sure. I'm not throwing any any big uh, scoop out there. He just uh, seemed to be have a hitch in his get along at one point. You know, last week is all. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to I just wanted to refer to that for my own peace of mind to think about how that was going to work because you know we saw another set of of captains so who or of ch champions excuse me who came out of that some guys who have played well and flashed and another one that you know you didn't mention that I'll be a little bit of a surprise Steel Chambers yes the champion in, in that as well so. I don't know. To answer your question, if Dallas Gant and that foot is right, senior, you know, he's got more experience than everybody else. You're trying to play a physical game against Minnesota or you're expecting one. You'd have to think that that Taraja Mitchell, Dallas Gant, and then potentially Cody Simon would be the three yeah. guys that you would roll with. But, you know, I, I just still think in, in most of these situations, um, and never knowing the exact moniker. And Craig Young said he considers more of a safety than linebacker at this point. You know, fine, whatever. I think if they roll out a starting lineup that is designed to stop the run, the third linebacker would be Craig Young. Now we'll see if that's what transpires. Um, again, that's why it's so <laughs> – let's get yeah. to Thursday. and Because we're going to find out a lot. I've said this a bunch of times, and I'm not just – it's not just because it's a live game, but like Minnesota's – they're a veteran team yes. with, a, with an offense that can be a handful and they're going to try and run the football and they have a veteran quarterback, senior quarterback. So, you know, what do we know about the Ohio state back seven? We know that there's a lot of talent and a lot of versatility and a lot of moving pieces. 
but we're going to know way more about it, you know, at Thursday, next Thursday at midnight, uh, about what this team can become and who are going to be key parts of that. Because we could speculate, and I bet between the two of us, we could come up with seven, seven different lineups. That would be pretty good. And on yep. paper, anyone in the country would take it. But which one is the way that they really want to go? You know, we've got educated guesses, but we just don't know. And are Zach Harrison, Tyreek Smith, Javante Jean-Baptiste, that's easy for me to say, uh, uh, Jack Sawyer, JT Tui Molowau, are they going to just blow up everything uh, Minnesota tries to do from the passing standpoint? Because you got to figure Minnesota's going to come out and test that defensive secondary, that defensive back seven, based on the way Ohio State finished the year last year and actually the way it played a lot of the year last year. So I think that's coming. Hey, real quick before we go, you know, um, in between the taping of my, of my previous podcast and this one, a fellow by the name of C.J. Stroud, I don't know if you've heard of him, C.J. Oh, really? Stroud was named the uh, starting quarterback for the opener against wow. Minnesota for Ohio wow. State. As I, as I likened it on our rapid reaction, uh, the LS like, you know, it was like Ryan Day also saying the sun is hot. But, uh, you know, that's a little profound. Uh, yeah. A little too right up there. But really, the guy we thought was going to win the job won the job. Uh, and forget about, you know, dicing all that up, that competition. Well, just give me one quick thought, quick thought on what this means for the offense. I, I see a very similar offensive approach that we saw the last two years because I think they've got a really good passer back there who's only going to get better the more games he plays. And uh, a guy who would rather run second than first, if you follow my drift, but he can run a little bit. Uh, but what's just your take? What's going to – I don't know what's going to be the characteristic that stands out about the CJ Stroud era as starting quarterback at Ohio state. Yeah, I think it's been kind of strange the way the, the battle has played out, how, you know, CJ Stroud has led throughout and that's, I guess it became so um, accepted, at least in my mind, maybe yours that he was going to win it, that you were looking at what the other guys could do to tighten the battle yeah. And, and what was happening with the backup battle. And maybe, you know, and maybe this is just for me, I don't know, that C.J. Stroud wasn't getting enough credit for how good he really is. And I think if anyone listened to what Garrett Wilson told BTN last week about the football that he throws, about the way that he carries himself, the, the leadership that he showed over the summer, lost in, maybe lost in all this talk about Kyle McCord's arm strength and how rapidly he's transitioned as a true freshman and probably going to be the backup maybe lost in the fact that, you know, Jack Miller has done, he, he had, you said, uh, I think it was last week. You saw him deliver some of those balls on Wednesday and that maybe that was the best he'd look. Yeah. You know, lost in the talk about those other guys. And then the arrival of, of Quinn Ewers. Wait a minute. Says, the arrival of who? Yeah. This, this other guy, go ahead. The four string guy who's currently unavailable till the end of the week. Um, is that C.J. Stroud was an Elite 11 winner, was a five-star who can throw a deep ball that <laughs> is absolutely beautiful to watch, um, who can run and did run a little bit for his offense in high school um, and is probably more willing to do that than, let's say, Dwayne Haskins and probably not as fast as Justin Fields. But if you've got something in the middle where you throw first and second and you can extend plays. Um, look, that's a mouthful what I said. If you're combining traits from those two guys, two of the best passers that Ohio State has ever seen, um, Dwayne with being a more physical presence and defenders seemingly bouncing off of them or ducking out of the way and stepping into it. If C.J. Stroud has to go play for the first time on Thursday. But all of the traits that I've seen tell me that this guy can live up to those expectations that Ohio State has for its quarterback, yeah. which is – to be a Heisman Trophy finalist, to become a first-round draft pick, and to compete and try to win a national championship. He checks every box. And this everyone who's listened to us since January knows that I'm not surprised that this is how it happened. But I just think that the way it played out meant that some of the attention wasn't on the guy who was leading the race because there was more intrigue about what was happening elsewhere. Now's that time. C.J. Stroud is going to get the spotlight, and it's his moment next Thursday night. And that's another part where it's just like 
you know, excited to see what's going to happen because we've been talking about it for nine months and, and now, Hey, there's, there's green light. It's time to go. When you went to the university of Wyoming and you turned in your, your exams, the essay questions, did the teachers just go, Oh my God, this is too detailed. This is like long. I mean, I'm going to give him an A and not even read it all. No, I'm just messing with you. But if that's your idea of a quick answer, you know, you can be on my filibuster team any time. Awesome. By the way, I agree with with everything you said. And uh, I started at the branding iron. (laughs) What? When I started at the branding iron, that was day one. As soon as I showed up on campus, I went in there. How do I get a job here? Well, you've got it. You know, um, we were paid by the column inch. So, Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I see where you're going here. So I, uh, you know, I'm obviously, I'm 10 years now into working online. And as you know, I pay more attention to the word counts and what works and doesn't work online, write tighter. Uh, I've been doing this long enough time that I've, I've gotten out of that part, but man, you tell a college kid that you're getting paid I think it was like a dollar 10 or something like that per column inch. Wow. And I'm like, yeah, cool. I'm writing 60 inches <laughs> about this, this feature in this game. I'm going long baby, because I need to pay for some, uh, some beverages for the weekend. That's so I've been, I've been doing that for a while. If, it, if it's gotta be done, if there's yeah. a reason to filibuster, I'll do it. That's funny. Cause uh, you know, I've gone the opposite direction uh, because uh, you know, I used to, we used to write under these tight, tight uh, word constraints at the dispatch all those years, especially late in the years when our, when our news hole got smaller and smaller. And uh, as you noticed, even my latest, uh, my latest <laughs> submission to you and Zach Harris, I told you I was going to keep it to 800 words or less, but that thing just creeped up there before I knew it. And I mean, you know, uh, I'm going to work on that myself. I'm going to work on rediscipline. I'm going to, I'm going to let your iron sharpen my iron and we'll see where it goes from there. But uh, we're, going have, we're going to have a Tim May Tuesday, the podcast yeah. coming up. And then Zach Harrison, so we just a little a little teaser that that'll be at Letterman Row to the captain finding his voice. I've already read it. Uh, yeah. That's on Tim May Tuesday. Yeah, there you go, man. I, hey, I like that. That sounds pretty damn good. But uh, but I digress. I agree with everything you said. I, I just you know it, it, real quick before we're done, I just keep reminding people. I was on like five or six radio shows today uh, already before we're we're taping this on around the country, and I keep telling them, man. This is the golden era, and I keep using that term. This is the golden era for Ohio State offensive football. I mean, I hope people are are enjoying it. I hope they're I hope they understand what they're getting to watch. I mean, just when you think you've seen it all, along comes Justin Fields, you know, in that group. And boy, just think about last year if there hadn't been the abbreviation that was pan the pandemic, which caused the abbreviation of that season, the numbers that they would have put up because they would have figured out Trey Sermon a lot earlier in the year than they did. Etc. And, uh, you know, Chris Olave, boy, what a joy it is for Ohio State fans to have Chris Olave back for another season because, you know, you can tell he wants, he hasn't said this, I don't think, maybe out loud, maybe he has. He wants another shot at the national championship. He's smart enough to know that once you go to the NFL, you don't get another shot, you know, at the national championship of getting that brass ring. Uh, And I'm sure that's part of his motivation for coming back. But, Boy, the collection of players they've got offensively this year, awesome. You, you We'll get into that maybe in our pregame build-up next week uh, podcast. But uh, it is, but the more you think about it, the more, I don't know, exciting it should be for Ohio State fans. Agreed? Man, I can't wait to watch it. I mean, yeah. we after I said this last week, and maybe it'll sound like uh, a replay, but just to get to that point, like last year was such a – weird year and, and us being removed from it with zooms and no practices and just glimpses of this and that. And, you know, this is like, we had something that was taken away from us, which is you and I love college football. We wouldn't have devoted our careers to it if we didn't. Yeah. So to actually, you know, have that back, um, you know, it didn't even need, it wasn't a situation where you didn't realize that you loved something or the appreciation had to be taken away. Like, we knew that it sucked when we were in the middle of it, but now that you get it back, I mean, I'm ready to celebrate a real year. I hope that, uh, that everything continues on a path that allows that to happen. I'm not going to 
start a new can of worms as we wind down here talking about that. But yeah. man, I just, I, I, I don't know that I've been more excited for a football season to start than this one. I agree. And ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be uh, pumping a little bit more uh, a week from now uh, on the next <laughs> version of the Tim May podcast, because really college football season is right around the corner. And like uh, is awesome. Speaking for me said, man, the excitement is in the air and it, you know, it's, uh, it's almost like uh it's almost like what can this offense do next is what's really intriguing to me. And does the Ohio State defense have its act together? We'll get a little more, bit deeper into that next week, Awesome. But Awesome Ward, thanks for joining the Tim May podcast again, man. Until next week, we'll see you then.